how many of you work in crypto? A lot of crypto people. How many of you have been to a FinTech conference before? All right, that's kind of what I imagine. And how many of you have been to some sort of panel or fireside chat or keynote or something talking about financial inclusion at one of these conferences? All right. So we're going to start off by talking about financial inclusion. When we're talking about the promise of DeFi and where things are headed, I think this is an important place to start. So most of you are familiar with the term. And just for those of you who aren't, and to kind of level set for this conversation, when we're talking about financial inclusion, we're really talking about a combination of two different types of individuals and how they're served by the existing financial system. So according to the World Bank, there are 1.7 billion people in the world that are unbanked. And what that means is they don't have access to a basic transaction account, a checking account, or something as their gateway into the financial system. Beyond that, you have the underbanked. So individuals that may have a basic bank account of some type, they may have access to basic banking features, but they don't have access to a full suite of financial products. They don't have access to savings vehicles, to investment vehicles, to lending, to things that are going to help them not only manage their current personal finances, but really build wealth for the future, build savings, build even just a rainy day fund. And we could go on and on. I have 20 minutes to talk to you today, so I'm going to try to keep it pretty concise and pretty much on track for how I thought about this while putting this presentation together. I was a FinTech research analyst for years before I got into crypto. I've seen this conversation evolve at these conferences with FinTech companies, and I've seen the way that there have been a lot of these issues tackled by FinTechs, helping to bank the unbanked, to provide services to the underbanked. But for those that are still excluded from the system, there are a lot of issues. There's a high cost. If you don't have access to the banking system, to the financial system, you can't build a credit history. You can't build a history that tells people they should give you financial services in the first place. And then you're forced out to higher cost solutions. You're going and you have to work with check cashing. You have to work with payday lending. You have to go to places where it costs you more to get access to those financial services compared to if you were able to get them through the traditional financial system, through you know, some sort of all-in-one solution. So to take a step back, there's a mix of reasons that people are unbanked. And I'll be frank, a lot of people just don't need access to a bank account. There are people out there who just don't need a bank account. Uh, they don't think they need a bank account. But for those that are truly unbanked and truly underbanked, the reasons that they don't have access to the financial system are pretty basic. They don't have enough money to have an account. Their local bank or their local financial institution won't serve them because they don't have enough money to start an account. Those that do have enough to start an account can't afford the fees. The interesting thing about banking is a lot of times on the lower end, you're getting charged more fees when you really can't afford to be charged those fees in the first place. And then there's some basic things, lack of physical access. You know, in the US, I think we're pretty well served with bank branches, and you know, we actually had too many bank branches. Now we're getting rid of them. But in the rest of the world, there are people that need access to physical banking, or that's the way that their banks are set up. They don't have mobile solutions, they don't have a website, they have physical bank branches, and people can't get to those. And then one of the reasons I was mentioned was just a lack of trust. People just don't trust financial institutions, and that's why they don't have accounts. So when you talk about people being unbanked, and you talk about some of these issues, and you, you see these reasons that people are mentioning, a lot of times it sounds like you're blaming banks, or you're blaming somebody who's not providing services to these individuals. And that's really not the case. The reason that banks have fees, the reason that financial institutions have fees, is they're paying just to keep their doors open. A lot of our banking infrastructure is just very outdated. It's very difficult to get things done. And think about this on a global scale. It's hard enough in developed countries. Think about trying to serve a global audience of the people that need banking. 
And this is for a lot of people in the room. Even when there are better solutions and ways to plug into this banking infrastructure or to provide services that can help these individuals, there's just a lack of direct access to actually go and build these solutions. Somebody could have a checking account, a savings account, and there could be an easy way to tie it into some sort of awesome solution you offer. Maybe you offer high yield savings or the ability, you know, maybe you have a robo-advisor, something where they would benefit from these solutions. A lot of times it's just difficult for people to build innovative products into the traditional banking system. And then of course, fragmented regulation. If you think about it, banks can't serve everybody everywhere in the world. It's not just a structural thing, it's not setting up the technology or setting up the, the you know, actual physical infrastructure, it is just nearly impossible to keep up with regulatory compliance across all of the jurisdictions out there. And then, I kind of touched on this before, but let's be serious. Financial institutions are businesses. They have fixed costs, they have employees, they have, uh, they have uh, rent they need to pay, and then at the end of the day, they need to make money, they have shareholders. So all of these reasons that you think about people being charged fees or having account minimums, all these things, aren't because banks and financial institutions don't want to serve people. Of course they do. They want more customers. That's more revenue. That's more people they can serve. But there are just so many structural issues that prevent people from offering these services. So as I was sitting down to, to, to write this, and I was really thinking about you know, what we have uh, in the program and the prompt for this, thinking about financial inclusion, I started to think, why are we trying to include people in this infrastructure, if maybe it just doesn't work for them. Maybe financial inclusion isn't really what we want to be building towards. Maybe we want to be building towards something different. So I kind of went, let's forget financial inclusion, OK? Um, and let's think about it a different way, because this conversation we're about to have is about something very new. It's about a new infrastructure. And for some of you, the crypto folks in this room, the people that are familiar with DeFi, some of this might be repetitive, but I really wanted to just lay out what it looks like to think about the next step beyond financial inclusion and how we actually empower individuals. So we're going to talk about financial empowerment. And this is kind of a buzzword, I'll admit it. But when I think about financial empowerment, what I think about is giving individuals, giving developers, giving everybody out there the ability to be their own bank, to build their own bank, to have that full stack of services that they can use for themselves or they can provide for their clients. Legally, if I work, you work for a crypto company, you have to put at least one meme in your deck, so this is mine. But be your own bank. I think that's something that people say a lot, and it really resonates with me. And then I think what gets lost in translation sometimes is being your own bank doesn't mean that Traditional banks will disappear. Fintechs will disappear. It means that we now have more tools to build services for those individuals. You can build your own bank. You can be your own bank. You can do whatever you want in this new world. And that's where DeFi comes in. So everyone probably has their own different definition of what DeFi means. For the purpose of this conversation, we're going to keep it really simple. Decentralized finance, DeFi, it's really just protocols, it's code. It's protocols that provide financial services in a permissionless, pseudonymous, and decentralized fashion. That's it. There aren't corporations, there aren't, there's nobody behind it. It is code that is providing these financial services for anybody that wants to build within DeFi. Obviously, there are a lot of benefits there. And this is still a very new industry. But first of all, protocols aren't businesses. Say bye to all those fixed expenses, those salaries, those rents. Protocols just provide, again, they provide the code to help power these financial engines. They're permissionless. So if you want to be your own bank and you live somewhere that maybe you aren't served by your current banking infrastructure, nobody needs to give you permission to participate in DeFi. You can just go start using these services any day, any time, whatever you want to. There are no minimums. You can just use them. It just works. And they're composable. And this is a big word, this is a big topic, we're not going to get too deep into it, but if you think about it, because these are all code, they're individual protocols provided to find financial service, you can build on top of them. You can have lending protocols that tie directly to investment protocols. 
you can automate so many things. There's so much power in the composability of these protocols because they're all built on top of blockchains. And they're decentralized. And this gets back to somewhat with the permissionless, somewhat with the composable, but if you think about it, being decentralized, again, has so many benefits that there is no way gatekeeping your ability to participate in these protocols, to participate in financial services. And they're virtual. Anybody with an internet connection can use DeFi. That's it. Anywhere in the world, you can have a Starlink satellite, you can have a mobile device, you can participate in DeFi. And we're going to touch on this last one a little bit towards the end, but one of the huge differences between traditional financial systems and DeFi is a lot of them are community and government. The people that are making the decisions about the future of these protocols, about how they spend their money, about the parameters of these protocols, about everything, it's not a corporation, it's not a regulator. It's the people that are using these services on a day-to-day -day basis. A little bit of a rehash, but again, looking at the difference between the traditional and the DeFi system, I'm gonna to touch on a few of these, but really the big, big benefits between having traditional financial accounts and DeFi go back to that permissionlessness, go back to the fact that if you think about it right now, if you want to go open a bank account, an investment account, an insurance account, a savings account, you could be opening four different accounts with four different account numbers, and you'd have to go through four verification processes. And that's difficult. Think about people that don't even have that documentation in the first place. How do you get started? If you can't go open one account, you need to open four just to have that basic financial stack. So if you think about it, identity, interoperability, the counterparties involved in these financial systems. DeFi has a lot of benefits. And again, it's digital. It's, a, it's based on a digital identity. It's very different than what we have in the traditional financial system. And it's growing. I think it's always nice to have an up to the right chart in there. So DeFi is becoming a huge, huge, huge industry. There is a lot being built on these protocols. This is, take the number with a grain of salt, this is the larger ecosystem within crypto, staking, DeFi, a lot of things being built on top of there. But what you really want to see is that trend. There's been a lot of activity over the past two years across the DeFi ecosystem. So what I wanted to touch on, really, is just thinking about what does that basic empowerment stack look like for individuals. Some of you may be familiar with some of these things, and I'm obviously leaving a lot off here. DeFi is a massive industry. There's a lot happening. But this is what I think about when I think about if I'm an individual or I'm building for an individual, what do I need just to have those basic financial services? What do I need to go from unbanked and underbanked to being able to participate in a financial system? And it really starts from the bottom with just some sort of stable store of value, somewhere to keep your money, something you can trust. You need access to savings. You need protocols or services that can let you save your money, earn yield, you know, not just have it sit there. You need to be able to borrow. I mean, people need to borrow money. There are so many reasons they need to borrow money when you're thinking about your full financial stack. And then obviously at the top is investing. How do you build wealth? You invest, that's the only way to do it. Especially now if you look at where you're getting savings accounts, investing is the way that you are going to be able to build your financial future. So what's at the bottom? Well, right now, what's really powering most of the DeFi ecosystem, and a lot of the money that's in there, is based in stable coins. And I know I'm gonna offend some people when I say store value, and I don't talk about Bitcoin or Ethereum. We can have that conversation if you find me afterwards. But really, if you look at the ecosystem right now, there's over $120 billion worth of stable coins in the system. And that's where a lot of people are keeping their money for a lot of different reasons. We'll talk about that in a second. There are two types of stable coins. There are fiat-backed stable coins. So most stable coins are pegged to a dollar. Very simple. One dollar, that's it. There are ones that have bank deposits behind them. Those are fiat-backed. And then there are crypto-backed. So they're actually based on crypto collateral. Still, mainly pegged to a dollar. And what's cool about these, I just wanted to use these two examples is there's a lot of reasons to want access to dollars. Um, 
you want to be able to participate in a, in a system if you have a currency that's being hyperinflated locally. You want access to things like dollars. You want access to savings, things like yield. Protocols like Compact, Vesper, things that can offer you a yield on the money that you have parked. You want to be able to borrow. Compact, Aave, there are a lot of products built in crypto that can offer you the ability to borrow against your collateral. And you want to be able to invest. The exciting thing right now about DeFi is you can invest in tokens, you can provide liquidity into these networks, you can truly be your own bank, your own hedge fund, your own trading firm, whatever you want to be, you get to participate, you get to be the one that's earning the fees off of these new financial systems. Robo-advisors, anything you want can be built on top of these protocols because of, like I mentioned, composability. And there are a lot of cool things happening. I just want to touch on them. We're not going to be able to discuss all the interesting stuff in crypto, but if you think about it, because of that full stack, because of that composability, people can earn money, they can invest money, they can save money. Everything happens directly in their wallet. You can automate all of it. So you're not just building the ability, you're not just creating the ability for people to participate in the financial ecosystem. You're giving them the ability to actually be empowered to build their financial future and govern that financial future through these permissionless, decentralized protocols. So you can earn, govern, invest, store, borrow, lend, whatever you want to do with a full DeFi stack. And it can be managed all in one place. So in closing, everyone benefits from DeFi. It's not just thinking about individuals being their own bank. It's thinking about how anyone can build a service for those individuals and power it with DeFi. Thank you. Find me after if you want to talk about more.